I'm Erica Lynn, and we all know the ocean is the most demanding environment on Earth, consistently testing the reliability and durability of our equipment. When you spend as much time fishing as I do, you know that reliable gear is essential for staying on the water. This is why I went with Abyss Battery to power my trolling motor, electronics, and outboard. The guys at Abyss Battery are rattling the saltwater industry by manufacturing performance marine batteries specifically designed for sonar, outboards, trolling motors, and electronic fishing reels. They're also Bluetooth compatible, so I found check and battery statuses right on your phone while you're out on the water is a huge game changer. To learn more about why Abyss batteries are used by the pros and factory installed by Premier Boat Builders, visit abyssbattery.com. Hello and welcome to the Publicly Challenged Podcast. I'm your host, Luke Oswald, and I hope you join me on my quest for knowledge to become a better public land hunter, angler, and forager. Stick with this and who knows, maybe we will learn something together. All right, before we get in the show real quick, I just want to talk about treelineacademy.net. That's Treeline Academy, the most comprehensive e-scouting course you could possibly ever, ever take. I've been talking about it so much. If you haven't heard by now, go and check it out for yourself. And use promo code PC2020. If you use promo code PC2020, you can save yourself 20 bucks when you sign up. With elk season starting in like a day or two, you might want to check it out. All right, now to the show. All right, so I'm sitting here and I'm talking to Christian Lazaridis of Western Binds. And Christian, I'm just going to go ahead and ask you to go ahead and introduce yourself. Hey, how's it going? That's right. It is me, Christian Lazaridis with Western Binds Designs down here just outside of Austin, Texas. That's pretty cool. It's a good place. Got some family down there and uh, I definitely, God bless Texas. Um, So how'd you get started with the business? With the Western Binds, I should say. It was really a fluke. Um, So Western Binds Designs, it was originally just Western Binds. And it was something, you know, years ago when my wife and I first got married, you know, Lee and Tiffany was out. And I was like, man, we could do something like that. You know, uh, you know, husband and wife team. We don't have kids. We don't really have many bills. We should just hunt and fish. And well camera shyness kind of became a a thing and really not knowing how to edit video. And, you know, back then you kind of had to hire somebody that actually knew how to do it, that went to college to learn how to edit. Now anybody can edit, you know, edit video, how you can do it on your phone. Yeah. Um, but when we, I kind of dashboard just like sandbagged it for a while. And when we got out to Colorado and I, I started trying to get into the Western hunting, you know, living the dream that all of us Midwestern guys, you know, really want to do is, oh, I've got this dream of going West and I'm going, I'm going to go to Colorado or Montana. Well, I got out there and started getting into the equipment and I, I kind of looked at it one day and said, man, I've got all this brand new equipment, brand, brand new stuff why don't I do a little video channel on it? And it did pretty well, uh, for a little while. And I had some hiccups with it and I ended up kind of sandbagging it again. It just, it wasn't what I wanted it to be. I wanted to do more hunting stuff. Um, but I just, hunting out West is not as easy as it is hunting in the Midwest. You know, in the Midwest, it's pretty much, the end of September all the way through January, for the most part, is a season of some sort, right? Whether it's archery, muzzleloader, rifle, shotgun, yada, yada, right? And it, it, it's much easier to hunt in the Midwest. So any of you Midwest or Eastern guys that think that you're going to go out West and hunt all the time, it, it's not really like that. I mean, there are certain places that you can, but if you're putting in for a draw hunt, and you don't have points, or even if you do, you're limited, right? So I was really limited in what I could hunt, and I was really left with a bunch of just junk tags that were left over, like, hey, here's an antelope, uh, a muzzleloader antelope hunt on this piece of flat parcel that there's nothing, 
there's nothing to draw them and you can go out there and try to hunt antelope if you want to. Um, and I did things like that and it just didn't, it just didn't work. And then I wasn't enjoying what I was doing anymore. And then one day I went to Nebraska, I got into trad hunting or trad, trad bow shooting. And it was something that I've always had an interest in. I've always been interested in the traditional archery. That was the first bows I had were traditional bows. But I just didn't know. I didn't understand. I felt like something was wrong with it, but I couldn't get any bow shop to like actually teach me how to do what I wanted to learn how to do. And it just so happened that moving to Colorado and I was living in Golden, I was right around the corner from RMS, which is like the trad bow mecca bow shop, right? This is like the best bow shop in the country for traditional archery. And in that, and, and it's owned by a guy named Tom Klum. And turns out Tom knows how to teach people how to shoot and does it really, really, really well. Um, so I spent every Saturday in that bow shop and I took multiple, multiple private lessons from Tom. And so anyway, I'm going out to Nebraska and I go on this trad hunt for turkey. I took my, my, my bow and I took a shotgun, but I really wanted it to just take my bow. So the shotgun was kind of plan B. Well, I accidentally dropped a broadhead across my string and it hit the string. And I, I'll never forget. It's kind of like one of those where you, you, you shut your car door and leave your keys in there and you go, <gasps> you know, it's like, oh, well, it was from that moment that I said, I've got to find a better way to protect the string of this thing. Cause I didn't have a spare with me. I didn't know. I mean, again, still really, really rookie green. And I went home and started screwing around with anybody that knows me. I will obsess over an idea forever until I get it worked out in my head. Sometimes it just comes to me and other times I will sit there and just roll over it and over it. I kept taking a towel and folding it over the bottom and the top of my bow. And I kept looking at it going, there's got to be a way to do it. And then it just clicked. So I had a couple pairs of old pants and I sewed them up into a funnel type shape and um, found a way to attach elastic to it in this clip system. Well, I went to a guy that was a professional, uh, he was a professional at this kind of stuff. And I said, hey, can you do this? Like, this is what I want to do. And here's kind of the rough templates of what I want and how I want it to be. And um, you know, I've got all these Western binds patches, just throw one on there for me, would you please? Oh yeah, sure. Well, wouldn't you know, I put a picture of it up and several of my other buddies that were kind of into the trad thing were like, dude, I want one of those. Can I get one too? And I was like, yeah, just cover the cost. I don't care. Well, that turned into, man, I really ought to actually just start selling these things, making them and selling them. And that's legitimately where Western Binds came from. <laughs> Legitimate was that trad sling that I just wouldn't let go, that nobody really wanted anything to do with other than me. Um, I reached out to a lot of different companies and was like, hey, listen, I've got a full-time job. I don't want this thing to die. Can we work something out? And nobody would even return a phone call. Um, but now it's turned into kind of my signature my signature uh, product. And along with that came a seat pad and the kit sacks and the corn sacks and, um, you know, that rifle sling that you were asking me about earlier with, uh, with lampers. So let's hear that story because I'm kind of curious how that all, all came about. Lampers and I kind of hit it off a while back. Like, a, like he had just kind of come on the scene with Brian and I had heard the name a little bit here and there. And I, I, I didn't really know him, but I had reached out to him and I was asking him more for health oriented stuff uh, because I'm a spitting image of health. You're a and, healthy, uh, healthy, I'm, I'm a, I'm a healthy <laughs> that's right. Right. <laughs> There's been a lot of corn. Um, but no, so I, he was getting ready to go on a hunt and I had come up with this. Of course, you know, when you start putting products out, everybody in the sun calls you up and says, man, you should do this. 
you should do that. <laughs> you should do this. You should do. And I'm going, well, you know, there's legitimacy here. And some of them are really, really good ideas, except for the crossbow sling. I refuse to do a crossbow sling. I just absolutely won't do it. Um, <laughs> Somebody else uh, will do it. Don't worry about it. <laughs> somebody else can do it. They're they're welcome to do it. You know, there's just I, I'm just I'm not interested. Um, but long and short of it was, so I went back to that sewer, the guy that made the was making the trad slings for me, and I said, hey, I know you're busy. Do you mind if I goof around on your tables with one of my rifles? And he said, no, go ahead. So I went over, and literally, it took me like. 15 minutes to come up with the first one. And I said, this is how I want it to clip. I want it to attach to a pack exactly the same way that my trad sling does with the two clips. Um, and how that really kind of came about was on my elk hunt. I had my rifle strapped to the back in a, um, in another rifle cover. And every time I went under a limb, I'd hit the barrel on a tree and then have snow all down my back. About drove me nuts, put me through a wall, you know, because it's it's kind of aggravating, right? Well, I wanted my rifle to sit lower, but I didn't want to, because one thing that just makes me uh, squeamish is watching somebody wrench a compression strap over an optic. Yeah. Because I've had optics move before. I don't know if you ever have, but I I, I had an optic that I know was torque to spec. I know. Th- it was mounted right, and somehow my crosshairs ended up cocked. And it was just a slight bump. So watching somebody run a compression strap over an optic just makes me cringe. So that's when it kind of clicked, like, okay, I want padding over my optic, and I want something to cradle the rifle. I want something that's going to keep snow and debris out of the barrel. Um, and the best one to date so far was the, the solo hunter rifle cover. And I still think it's a great cover. Um, it, it has a lot, a lot of positive attributes. I just wanted something that clipped to actually clip to, uh, my backpack. Well, I, I started talking to Lampers and he said, you know, I'd, I'll, I'll, I'll give one a run for you. Let me try one. All right, so I had a couple sewn up special with his name on them. You know, I I, I was buying a lot of patches. I buy a lot of patches, and I had said, hey, to my patch supplier, can you take this logo and put it on here? And they said, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I did that, and I had it sent out to him. So he had his own very special one that <laughs> didn't have my name on it, right? And he was like, dude, I got to be honest. This and your seat pad are pretty sweet. And I said, well, heck, we ought to just call it the Stealthy Sling. And it was just joking. It was c- kind of, you know, he said, he just kind of let it go with that. <laughs> and he said to me, he said, I'll tell you what I would like to see is I'd like to see a couple changes. I don't like your butt stock section. And I said, well, I don't care. I like the butt stock section. I think that has value to it, especially for like a Midwestern guy that's running uh, muzzleloader hunts. You want to be able to put all those little packets of powder and things like that in there and your tools and whatnot, your license. It, it's, it's got value to have the butt stock section. Yeah, but I want, it, I, I want you to be able to remove these buckles, and I want something else. I said, okay. Well, as it turns out, there were enough changes that Ryan wanted that I just said, you know, dude, why don't you run with it? You know, I'll make it exactly how you want it. But you're keeping my butt stock section. <laughs> and he just kind of laughed at me. He said, All right, all right, all right. And and, and it's a very modular system. We actually, I mean, every there, there's a lot of companies out there that have great sling type setups, but that that's the short and the sweet of it. You know, we've got the little sumo belt, which is basically just a thing for the butt stock to slip into. Um, and it's nice if you're running, even if you have a shotgun and you don't want to carry it. You know, you can put your shotgun on the back of your pack and it's sitting in that cradle. And it's, it's that section of it's not much different than anything else, but it still has the ability to clip into your pack. So whether you're trad hunting or rifle hunting or whatever, you can still clip. Use the same clips. You just clip them on, leave them, set it and forget it. And That's then you can just cool. swap, switch your, 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 your weapon out. 
Um, and then, of course, with that was the seat pad cover as well. So I don't know if you'd seen the seat pad, but one of the problems I had on my elk hunt, and there was a lot of revelations on that elk hunt. I learned, <laughs> I learned a lot. I had a piece of foam, black um, XPE foam, that was just one inch thick, and it was, you know, whatever size. Well, every time I wanted to get into my dang bag, the wind would blow, because it does in the mountains, right? And my seat pad would go flying. And it drove me crazy. So I said, you know what? I'm going to make a cover for my seat pad that's got a strap on it that I can run the horizontal compression straps through so that even if it does, the wind does gust and catch it, all it's going to do is flop over because the buckles are going to end up catching it. And I said, okay, that's a good idea, but why not make one side blaze orange and one side uh, solid? Because my backpack's green. My orange vest is completely co is covered by my backpack. I'd like to have something orange on the back of my pack when it's rifle season. So with that being said, I learned uh, my elk hunt, kind of how you had learning experiences too. Mine, I had a climate inflatable butt pad. And so if you blow it up beforehand and the moisture from that thing is from your breath is in that pad and then it's cold after you deflate it and the next morning you go to reinflate it, it doesn't inflate because it's all frozen. <laughs> so <laughs> unless you're carrying it in your jacket, it's kind of pointless. So then I stuck it in my coat and let it warm up inflated it and was sitting on some little bit of scree and guess what happened got Pop. a hole, hole in it and it popped <laughs> i'm like well this is absolutely useless so yeah. it's kind of funny that i didn't know it was your actual butt pad but i've seen lampers using that butt pad and i was like that's a pretty slick setup he's got there it's kind of nice it clips right to the back of his pack you know, it's always there and you don't have to inflate it and it's nice and lightweight. So that's pretty cool. I got to give you props it, on that one. It, it, again, it, it's, it, it's perfection and simplicity and just trying to keep something super simple and just dummy proof. And, you know, um, I'm not, not to throw anybody under the bus, but somebody on one of Lamper's hunts lost their custom seat pad. If it wasn't for the blaze orange, they would have never found it. It blew off. It, a gust of wind caught it because they didn't <laughs> clip it to their pack and caught it and sent it flying. And they ran off after a, a critter. And when they came back, it was the blaze orange that caught, the, uh, caught their eye and actually uh, helped them with it. I think Lampers told me also that there was a time where they dropped their pack and had it not, you know, the blaze orange made it a lot easier for them to find. Um, another idea that I had with it was flagging. So if somebody is on the opposite ridge from you and you're trying to tell them what to do, you can sit there and do all the hand signals you want, but it's kind of hard to tell. Well, with that, that pad, you can go down and over or down and over the other way or no, he's up ahead of you or you know, flag off, deer's gone. You can do whatever you need to do with it. Um, and that really was just kind of, again, the, the, the silliness behind it, and it just worked. No, and it's really nice, <laughs> and they're really comfortable. And I use it, even when I'm washing the car, I use my seat pad to, <laughs> to kneel on to scrub my tires. I mean, it's <laughs> thousand denier Cordura. You don't get much tougher than that. Is, and all your products, they're uh, most of them, right? I mean, come from America. They're all American all sources. All of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Berry compliant materials, um, hundred percent American made, and then the the material itself is berry compliant. So those that don't know what that means, it, it's like one step above made in the USA. So that Cordura actually has to uh, be manufactured in the U.S. with American made components. Um, so the seat pad is the same. I use an, other small businesses. I don't sew anything. Um, you don't want anything that I sew. I leave that to guys <laughs> that actually know what they're doing. Now, I will say I'm very picky. I like things a very particular way, and it's got to be perfect every time. Otherwise, I'm not shipping it out the door. 
So you may run into me somewhere and go, I was thinking about buying one of your rifle slings, but that one's butt ugly. Well, that's because I keep the junk ones for myself and give all the good ones um, to customers. So you you keep the prototypes that you design? Or I you just keep saying, the yeah. prototypes yeah. slash <laughs> uh, the sower was having an off day. It got a little close to beer 30. Yeah, those those usually stay with me if they can't be repaired. Understand. <laughs> so what yeah. kind of uh, what kind of hunting are you planning on doing then? Uh, this year, no excuses. I am going to Arizona. Um, I am going to go do the, the cool kids hunt. I'm going after, um, I'm going after mule deer though. I, if I happen across a stud coos, then so be it. Um, but I'm going after mule deer, mule deer, and I'm going to put in for the javelina. Um, and hopefully I may even, if I have a little extra time and I'm not in a big rush, I uh, might try to do some quail hunting, some jackrabbit, things like that. That'd be pretty cool. That's a long drive for me, but I've, I don't know. I've been thinking about doing that one for, well, pretty much since Randy Newberg, once again, we were talking about Randy before. I mean, pretty much, pretty much any Midwesterner. I, and I've come to this conclusion that pretty much any Midwesterner, Randy Newberg has had a pivotal role in an ex- inspiring or something or, or creating <laughs> the effect to, to get people out there and try it and go do it. I think um, it's pretty amazing. Randy Newberg, Tim Burnett. I mean, these guys are the godfathers of what we do. Yeah. You know, I mean, uh, Remy Warren, Tim Burnett, Randy Newberg. Um, you know, Brian call was getting into the mix and I remember his kind of breakthrough role with Tim Burnett, where he was showing that one Sitka blacktail hunt. And that was the first time I'd ever heard of Brian call. Um, but again, I'm a Midwestern guy and it, it, it's, it's amazing how much the worlds just don't meet as much as they should. And they should, (laughs) they really, really should. I think uh, the the first people probably to to make those world meet would be probably like the hunting public and the born and raised outdoors got together and They're started doing, doing that stuff. Job yeah. With it. yeah, yeah. You know, I saw one. I think it was last year, or the year before, where the hunting public um, did a hunt with one of the guys from um, uh, the flat brimmers from from Utah. Um, the hush, hush. And, yeah, 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 yeah. Hushin. Yep. Uh, one of the guys from there went on a hunt with, um, the hunt in public. <laughs> the flat and, <laughs> Well, I don't, I, I know that sounds so mean. I, I don't mean it that way, but that's the, the best way to describe it is there's a group of guys, they all wear flat brims, you know, you, crispy boots, uh, and so forth and <laughs> whatnot. And they're, I'm sure they're really nice guys. I don't mean that as a shot. So no, if any it, of you guys are, are listening, it's not I, a shot. It's, <laughs> but I do, if you go on my website, you, you got to check this out. I do actually sell Smokey it. the Bear stickers that say, say no to only you can prevent flat brims. I have seen it. <laughs> do you know, do you know how many people buy that sticker? Probably a lot. I mean, a lot. Even, there's a lot of Westies. I call them Westies. I'm sure they probably don't like that, but um, I, a lot of Westies even don't like the fr- flat brims, you know, I think it's mostly a Utah thing. I could be wrong on that, but uh, it seems to be a California, uh, a Utah thing. Yeah. More, <laughs> more than anything is a California, Utah, uh, California and Utah. Now you will see like in Arizona, the, the subtle curve <laughs> yeah. flat brim, like the ever so slightly. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's all meant in, in good fun. And I don't, I, you know, everybody's got their own style. It's just, I like a curve in my brim. Uh, and that's just always been, you know, you buy a hat and the first thing I would do is take the brim and tuck it and roll it right through the back end of the hat or See, um, stick mine, it in a coffee mug. Mine has changed a little bit because sunglasses have gotten bigger and wider and the wraparounds and different stuff. So now I put less, less of a curve in the brim otherwise it hits and pushes your head up too high but maybe that's why well, they now they've got, i don't know now they have curved brims that actually have knockouts i'm not buying lights. the notched i'm not buying into it but <laughs> yeah I, i'm not i'm not either 
to be honest. I'm not either, but I, yeah. I did think that that was pretty funny. Um, but yeah, those I had somebody today order a dozen of that Smokey the Bear sticker from me. That's funny. A dozen. So uh, let's talk a little bit about like the trad bow. I, I mean, I know you talked about it. So you hunted with the trad bow first and then you kind of got away from it and got into your modern tackle so and then went back I, or what? Yeah, kind of, sort of. Um, you know, it's kind of like, like I think any, uh, a lot of kids journeys is you grow up with a pedal bike and then you buy a bike with gears and then you get a car and you forget about everything, right? Well, I mean, it's it's not a whole lot different uh, for me. I didn't grow up in a hunting family. I have I had one uncle that that hunted, and my dad's bosses were, you know, they they hunted. You know, they were Ducks Unlimited guys and stuff like that. But I didn't really have any real role models, so I had to teach myself. But I remember being a kid and going down to Acme Click. Do you remember Acme Click? Mm -mm. like the grocery store. It was a grocery slash hardware store. Um, and they had a sporting goods section and they had wooden arrows with, uh, crimped on tips and feathers. And I had an old bear, uh, longbow that for all intent and purposes was nothing more than a glorified driveway marker with a string on it. (laughs) And I used to try to go and stalk rabbits and ducks. Um, we always lived in an area where there were ponds and, and fields and stuff like that around us. Again, typical Midwest, right? And I'd go out and sneak around and, you know, try to get up on a rabbit or get up on a duck. And I'll, I'll never forget it. And I still remember it to this day. The very first shot I ever took with a bow was at a, was at a, a mallard. And it was in just this little drainage pond. Um, and I got right up to it. I mean, right up to it. I still swung and missed, but I remember clearly like it was yesterday. And that was, good Lord, that was 35 years ago. I remember (laughs) letting that arrow go and just missing the duck, and I was hooked. It was over. But I didn't, I just didn't know. And then I got older, and the the first deer I'd actually taken was with a muzzleloader, just an old USAK knight. And I had some buddies in high school that were into hunting and, you know, we got out of high school and I bought my own gun. My parents weren't into owning guns and they didn't, we had them, but they wouldn't let us anywhere near them. Um, but the trad thing always just stuck with me. I was always drawn to pick up a trad boat and at least pull the string back, you know, because there, there's this great mystery of three under versus split finger. And then you have a recurve versus a long bow and, there was just something super cool and primitive about the stick and string. <clears throat> but again, when I really was coming of age in the hunting industry or hunting world, it was the day of Michael Waddell. Um, you know, real tree guys were King Toxie Haas, uh, Primos, Lee and Tiffany. Those guys were, were, were on top of the world at that time. Yeah. And Matthew switchback. That was the bow to have. And I bought a Matthew switchback. I still have that Matthew switchback and I would still hunt with that switchback, but I've pretty much just made uh, a dedication to, to the trad thing. I enjoy its purity. I enjoy its simplicity. Um, The style of hunting that I taught, kind of taught myself. And I mean, I I had a lot of influences, you know, Ted Nugent was really big when I was a kid too. And I, one of the first books I ever read was, gosh, I think it was called blood origin or something like that blood trails. And he talks about tying a feather to his string. And when you're out stalking, you quarter into the wind and, and I'm sitting there going, okay, all right, I get it. I get it. Yeah, you know what happened to me? <laughs> so one of the first deer hunts I ever went on, I, again, this is bow, this is just bow hunt. And it was one of the first deer hunts I'd been on, period. I was hunting a friend's farm. And they said, oh, yeah, you know, you can come out here and hunt. We don't care. And they didn't expect me to do anything. Well, 
I don't know where to go sit. I don't know, but I looked at it uh, uh, very objectively and said, okay, well, deer are where they've been. So how do, how do I track a deer? I didn't even know how to track. I said, well, there's a creek. Deer walk through the water. They're going to come up the creek, just like in the cowboy films. The tr- tracks are going to be on the other side if they've been through the, you know. So that's how I started. That's literally how I started hunting was tracking deer, just using common sense of, well, the deer are going to go to the water. When they cross it, there's going to be trails, and I'll figure out which direction they're going and just go super slow. Dude, I jumped a beast. <laughs> And I, it, 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 I ended up shooting him and I didn't know better. I, I, I didn't, <clears throat> I mean, it's no excuse, but I really didn't. I didn't know. I ended up shooting him, couldn't find the arrow, couldn't find the deer. It was with a, at the time it was with a Jennings, an old Jennings boat that I had gotten from a guy at work. It had no rest. It was just pins. I was shooting off the shelf. No peep sight, no kisser button, no release, just string, string and sights on a compound. That that's how like little guidance I had. They found that deer six months later, and he had Coke cans for bases. <laughs> Nothing. I mean, it, 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 it where that where I saw the deer run to was where I thought it went. And the guy that owned the farm, like, stopped me. He's like, oh, you didn't hit that deer. You didn't hit that deer. And I said, I saw that deer run down there. I know I hit him. I heard, I heard the hit. Uh, You didn't actually hit that deer. You didn't hear. So I let somebody talk me out of it and got me second guessing, but only to know that his dog found it six months later. And if you know what multiflora rose is and how thick multiflora rose is, that's where the deer was. Yeah, it normally was they that, go thickest, nastiest, or if they find water, yeah, it seems it, like, you know, they just... Yep, <laughs> downhill towards water, and yep. that was my true first archery, my true first deer, period, was just this brute of, of a buck. Um, and I learned so much from that first deer because it influenced every other deer I hunted since, where it was work, 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 but real slow. And then I'd wait for him to jump. And that deer, what he did is the does ran over here, 40, 50 yards. He ran up, jumped out in the field and stopped at 25 yards. And you know how white tails are. If they didn't smell you, if it was just a sound thing, they often will do that where they'll just run out, stop and look back. Yep. And that has been, I have got, I have taken more, more deer using that tactic than sitting in a tree stand than any other uh, method of take aside from uh, snort and wheeze. That's pretty interesting because I've, I've never really done a whole lot of still hunting. I mean, but like your story with the, with the compound and then like getting into trad and the simplicity of it, that's kind of the same as how I ended up getting <clears throat> into the trad bow, even though now I'm back to a compound again, but same thing. I had one season where I hunted and I had three rest break and like four sight pins. And I was just like, this is terrible. I'm I'm done with this. And I had a buddy who just picked up a longbow and started shooting it the the season before. And he's like, yeah, well, I don't have to worry about that. You know, give me, (laughs) give me a bunch of crap about it. And, uh, so I was like, okay, all right. So I went and bought a recurve. Absolutely hated it. Couldn't hit with the recurve for nothing. I don't know. Maybe the limb tips were too thin. And then I ended up buying a Kodiak, which the string angle was so sharp on my fingers. And I shot split finger and it just seemed like it really pinched them. So then mm-hmm. I was like, okay. And then I went and ended up getting a longbow and loved it. And I shot that for a couple of years. And, and, uh, then I just kind of started losing confidence in myself and went back to the, to the compound just kind of a few years ago. Anyway, less well, time, and that's you know. You know, it, it, it's, you know, maybe you'll pick it up again. Oh, you know? absolutely. <laughs> yeah. It, it's for me, it filled the void because I love the speed of a compound, right? I love the sound. I love the, 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 the explosion 
of when you hit the release and that thing just, whoosh, right? I mean, it's just cool. But there's something so, the degree of difficulty with a trad bow is so different. Every little thing that you do impacts what that arrow does. And I can go out there and I can drop a half dozen arrows and be all 10s and 12s at 20 yards, go pull the arrows, go right back, and then all of a sudden I'm shooting uh, fives. And I'm going, <laughs> uh, how? All, all it was was like I just, I just sunk every one of them and now I can't do it. You changed up your and form that's what, just a little bit? <laughs> just the it. littlest bit, man. The littlest change. And it changes everything. That's I always and found. <laughs> I always found when I, I was just, when I was fresh, it seemed like mm-hmm. I'd always hit real good when I was fresh. But then if you kept shooting and shooting, I was better off shooting like three or four arrows and then being done. Walking away and maybe coming back a couple hours later. And I don't know if it was like a focus thing. Or just like you just fatigue. get tired. Yeah, you you get you get tired. Um, target panic is a is really amplified with the trad bow. And there are days where I can't. I don't even get the anchor. Like I'll draw the anchor and almost get there, and it's like my head goes, "You're almost, almost. Oh, let it go," and then it's gone. <laughs> yeah. And then it's like son of a gun. And usually, you know what? Oddly enough, those are the ones that are bullseyes. Um, uh, you know, like just right smack dab in the middle, but it wasn't right. So that's not good enough for me, right? It was like, I didn't intend on it to do that, but it did it anyway. Uh, maybe there's something to be learned in that. Maybe Joel Turner will will call me and say, you idiot, that's what I've been trying to tell you. So I want to I wanna ask you about, I mean, it's got to be like a Texas thing or something, those corn sacks. Um, yeah, it's, 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 so... it's totally a Texas thing. Okay. Totally so... a Texas thing. So my thought is, is your because you can bait on even even your public ground. Can you bait on that too, or no? I don't know on public. I do know on private. You're allowed to. You're allowed to bait. And so you're hiking in real far or something. And no, here, here's here's in the rest of the country. Don't knock it until you've actually seen it and you understand it. Texas is thick. It is thick. And the deer and the game are super, super spooky. It's always hot. So the animals aren't near as active during daylight hours. So a lot of times what they have to do is they time it with um, corn feeders. And what you'll want to do is, like, let's say that your corn feeder goes off at 7 o'clock in the evening. Well, the minute that feeder goes off, the animals come flying from all around to eat. They've been laying up in the cool and the and everything else, and they're not coming out unless they know there's food. <laughs> so one of the tactics is guys will take a bag of corn, a little sack of corn, and they'll dump it at 20, you know, 15, 20 yards away from their stand. But they take corn in with them. So as the animals are moving around, there's a little pile that just happens to be within bow range. But you just, that's just the way it's done here. Uh, It's just different. But the corn sack is built heavy enough that it's got a lot of good uses. Um, You know, for it's nine inches by 18 inches, thousand denier Cordura. It's got a handle in the middle, a handle on an end. You could fill it with sand. You could train with it. You could do all sorts of stuff with it. I found I just thought it was interesting. I'm like, that's got to be a Texas thing for the. It, it was totally a, te- <laughs> a, a lot of. I I said something to a guy because I, I was making a, a cold call. I mean, I'm in sales as it is, but I stopped in a bow shop and a guy was like, "Hey, we have these things called corn sacks," and I just kind of laughed like you did. I'm like, "What?" And this was right after I just moved here, and uh, I stopped in another bow shop and I said, "Hey, dude, this guy's telling me about these things called corn sacks. Is he is he jerking my chain or?" He says, oh, no, we usually just use a Crown Royal bag, but no, that's legit. That's something you got to do here. <laughs> okay. That's funny. Well, I, always, <laughs> I always give my cousin a bunch of crap because he's got a hunting lease and he's always trying to me to get me to go in on the hunting lease with them. And, and I'm like, look, man, I, I get it, you know, and, and, and you might have to do that in Texas unless you want to drive a couple hours or something to go to some public or whatever. But 
I'm not going to fly all the way down to Texas just to shoot two deer with, with, uh, with the lease, you know, and, and bait it the whole time. I said, it's just not, you know, it's not my thing. And he looks at me like, well, what, what, what else are you going to do? <laughs> and I get it. Cause I mean, Texas, they could be on somebody else's ranch stealing the cattle feed or, you know, whatever. And you're never going to see them unless you got a bait, some type you'll, of bait you'll pile. Never, you'll never see them without the bait. Yeah. Now, I will tell you that the other night, and I'm not exaggerating. People are going to listen to this, and they're going to think I'm crazy. I saw more deer in one evening than I've seen in my entire life combined. Easily 600 deer going from <laughs> in, in, in route from Bernie, uh, Bernie, Texas, which is uh, northwest of um, uh, San Antonio, on my way back up through Bull Verde, and on my way up through uh, New Braunfels, Kyle, and on my way home. It was just, it was that perfect evening where everything was out and active. Like, just right before, you know, that dusky twilight mm-hmm. time. Yep. They were everywhere. It's everywhere. Cool. But I saw in one evening more deer than I've ever seen in my life combined. In, in an hour and a half drive. At least you it did. was a trip. <laughs> didn't hit any of them but <laughs> no some of them some of them were, were high fence but there's a lot of times where you don't see it you know so take that into account too that some of those were high fences that i was driving past but the deer were out and they were active and they were feeding and and, and whatnot so yeah you get to see some of those texas freaks that you see in the oh yeah those <laughs> magazines and whatnot dude it's those are intimidating but what what's funny is some of them they're just little body deer yeah. They just have these huge, huge racks. I mean, well, that's kind of like a, a Texas deer anyway, just in general, the smaller body, you know, <laughs> you know, and compared yep. to like you go to Texas and I see, I go to Texas and see the deer down there in Texas and come back here to Illinois and you look at them and it's like, wow, big difference, you know? But then, I mean, you look at the deer that are here in Illinois and they're just, they're bigger, but they're fat. They're not like a super muscular deer and then you go to like idaho and like guys like troy pottinger and he's killing those giant mountain bucks and they're just solid beasts it's crazy or the alberta. difference yeah yeah those, those deer up in like alberta where they they look like um like a fat coos deer <laughs> because they got this what looks like a little rack and that little rack is actually like 150 inches but it's on a 400 pound deer yeah it's on Lou uh, I, no. <laughs> yeah yeah I got, a, I got a buddy back in Ohio that um, he shot a, a, a buck one year. or a, No, he helped a buddy drag one out. 310 dressed. That's crazy. 310 pounds dressed. That's insane. That's freaking but, mini elk. But, yeah. yeah. But people here don't, in Texas, they don't understand unless they've been there. That deer here are 15 to 20% smaller than they are in uh, up the northern strain. Yeah. And I can't remember how many different strains of whitetail that there actually are. I think there's like seven or eight. Um, but that that deer that, that's from our neck of the woods, and I think yours are even bigger than Ohio, and then Wisconsin are a little bigger, and then when you cross over into Canada, they're significantly bigger um, just because of the, the constant food. And... Of course, there's that scientist, uh, I, and I can't remember his name, but his theory is the farther you get from the equator, the bigger the animals get. Hmm. Uh, and the same can be said for coyotes. We got, if you've ever been to Arizona and you see the coyotes in Arizona, they're teeny tiny little, you know, overgrown chihuahuas. <laughs> but you look at some of them that we've got up in the Midwest and they're dang near, people think they're wolves. Yeah, I, I've seen some You know, big 75 ones. Yeah. pound coyote. Yep. Um when I was in Tennessee and I was, I had a trap line, I, I trapped for uh, a, a number of years in Tennessee and the biggest coyote I ever caught was like 35 pounds. I caught bobcats hmm. that were 40, 40, 45, but the biggest coyote was 35. Yeah. That's one thing we're starting to see a lot more of is bobcats where uh, they're slowly migrating up, you know, into the Northern Illinois a lot more. They're yeah. awesome. I absolutely, I, I, I love to hunt them, trap them, see them. Um, I know they're, they're I, I think it's just a good barometer of a healthy ecosystem. 
you know, coyotes, coyotes are just, I don't have a soft spot for them. Um, I don't, I respect them, but not like a bobcat. I mean, it, if you've ever held a big bobcat in your hands and you see the muscle on them, and then you sit there and go, I wonder what a mountain lion's like. <laughs> you can get a whole different world of respect for a bobcat. But yeah. it is definitely um, a, a barometer of a healthy environment uh, and things that are, that are doing well when bobcats can proliferate. You know, so, for a lot of years, they just weren't many, hardly anywhere. Yeah. Uh, one thing I was, one more thing I wanted to ask you was about like, how did your, uh, your pack sacks come about for all the different oh, the kit sack? Yeah. Okay. So the kit sack that yet again was one of those stupid, I had a bunch of four way stretch and I had some projects that I was working on that I wanted to use that four way stretch for. And I told a guy that was sewing for me, I said, Hey, I need some of these little, um, stuff it type sacks, pullouts, whatever you want to call them. Um, will you make me a half dozen out of some of that four way stretch and go ahead and throw my patch on them? Wouldn't, you know, I put a picture of it up online and boom, every one of them I made, I, I can't hardly keep them in stock. <laughs> it's pretty Guys interesting. Like it. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it's, they're different. The problem is the fabric's expensive. Yeah. So I don't make hardly anything on them, but I like the fact that guys like the product. So that so, makes me happy. I mean, what are they like weight versus, you know, a different product from oh, somebody else or something? They're probably comparable to a Cordura, something the same size and a Cordura weight, maybe a little bit lighter, but certainly not as, you know, tissue paper light as a, uh, a cell nylon. Okay. Um, you know, any, anybody that's got cell nylon, those don't weigh anything. Those are so light. Um, but in comparison to a cell nylon, this is pretty close to, I mean, the, the four way stretch is a very water, highly water resistant fabric. Um, it's stretchy. The six by nine size is the perfect size. I can put a ton of stuff in one of those pouches and now I'm making them in, uh, in, in four different colors regularly and blaze whenever I can get my hands on blaze. Yeah. Um, is that... Blaze is just, it's not a, 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 a common color. It's somebody special ordered it and they just happen to have an overrun or something like that. And I can pick it up. Gotcha. Yeah. No, I saw them the other day and I, I you were talking about them and all your different kits you put together with them and pretty cool. Yeah, I really, I really genuinely like them. And that's, that's a big part of what I do, man. I don't want to be the guy that's creating stuff just to sell it. I, the stuff I want to put on my site and you won't see that I don't have a lot of products, but everything I have is pretty darn nice and it works. And that's, that's more important to me than just coming up with something to, to sell. Like, I was going to do a compound case and I couldn't do one. It, it, I had it, I had it done and it was ready to go and a prototype and the whole nine yards. And I just told myself like, would you actually buy this? And I said, no. And I scrapped it. And I said, I don't care how perfect it is, how good it is. Um, it's just not something that I could find value in. So I'm not going to push it. Was it like a hard case or a soft case? No, it was very much like a rifle sling, trad sling type thing. It it, it had more protection than anyone else's out there. Um, but it was to the point where, you know, compounds are very um, all over the place. There's a lot of different sizes and shapes. And, and, and in order to do that, I had to create something that was quote unquote bulky. And I wasn't happy about that. Um, I didn't like the look of it. I didn't like the function of it. Um, uh, true. You couldn't beat the, the, the protection that there was, but it just wasn't something that I was proud of. And I was like, I'm, I'm not going to be that guy. Yeah. I'm not going to be the guy that's just coming up with something just to come up with it to fill the void. Maybe someday it'll hit me and I'll go, ah, okay. Maybe yeah. I should just do this. No, that's pretty cool. Um, this probably it's getting kind of late. Um, probably a good time to 
wrap this up. I appreciate you coming on, talking to me, talking about your products and all the BS and we did beforehand before the episode. Yeah, I look forward to it. <laughs> yeah. I, you ever want to get together again? I, 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 I feel like I'm talking to a, a neighbor from back home. <laughs> I, I, I miss the, I do miss the Midwest and, um, I've got a lot of customers in the Midwest and you know, that, that it's a, it's a great part of the country. It's the heart and soul of the country, in my opinion, for sure. So before we go, Christian, I want to ask you if you could tell everybody where they could find you, find your products, all that good stuff. So you can find me most active on, uh, on Instagram at Western underscore binds, or you can go to www.westernbinds.com. And, um, yeah, we've got a lot of stuff coming back on. Um, when, when I moved to Texas, I, I did back burner the business a little bit and kind of put it off and a little bit of growing pains to get through that, but I'm starting to get uh, inventory back up online. We got a, a, a pre-sale on a knife right now. Um, my corn sacks will be coming in the mail soon. And so will, uh, so will the kit sacks. So the kit sacks, uh, kit sacks and corn sacks, they're, they're, they're on pre-sale because when they hit, they are gone. They, they sure don't last long. All right. That's pretty cool, man. I appreciate it. And thank you so much for coming on. Oh, absolutely. Thank you. Have a good evening. You too. Once again, thank you so much for listening to the Publicly Challenged podcast. I hope you enjoyed the show. And if you did, please subscribe on whatever platform it is you're listening to. Also, if you could leave a review, that would help us out. And you can check us out on Instagram or at publiclychallenged.com. And once again, thank you so much for listening to the show.